Gulube, and this is the second of our three webinars on the book. Um, and the book is titled International Economic Law, Southern African Perspectives and Priorities, edited luckily by two of my guests this afternoon, so Ms. Kolofelo Kugla and Ms. Francisca Sukka. Um, we, so the format of this webinar is going to go as follows. Each one of our authors um, is going to have 10 minutes to present. Um, questions are allowed. If anything, questions are encouraged. This is your session, so we'd really appreciate any and all questions. Uh, in that 10 minutes, each presenter is going to have two minutes to walk through a summary of their chapter. Thereafter, we're going to have an interaction. Um, and yeah, that's really going to be the order of events. So joining us this afternoon, we've got four of the contributors to the book. The first is Professor Oladisi Akinkube. He's an assistant professor and a Viscount Bennett Professor of Law at the Shilich School of Law, Dalhousie University. Before joining Shilich School of Law, Professor Ken Kube was an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law, University of New Brunswick, Canada. He is also the founding editor of Afronomics Law, the leading law blog on all aspects of international economic law as they relate to Africa and the global south. So we are really lucky and grateful to have you this afternoon. Joining him is Ms. Kolofelo Kugla, who is the co-editor of the book and a doctoral fellow at the University of Lucerne. She's on sabbatical from the Advisory Center on WTO Law in, in Geneva, Switzerland, where she works as counsel. She's also a visiting research fellow at the School of Law, Wits University. Joining her is Francisca Sukka, who is the co-editor of this book and an associate professor at the School of Law at the University of Wits. Uh, she serves as the executive co-treasurer of the Society of International Economic Law, SEAL, Prior to working in South Africa, Francisca worked as a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Law and International Law in Heidelberg. And the last one of our guests and contributors is Professor Jonathan Claren. He's a professor at the School of Law and at the Witts Institute for Social and Economic Research, WISER. Uh, in 2016, Professor Claren was appointed as an acting judge at the High Court. He has also served as the head of school at the University of Wits and a director of the Mandela Institute. Um, so we thank Mandela Institute for hosting this event for us as well. So, so perhaps we should start with the first of our guest, uh, Professor Akin Kube, and hopefully I have not butchered your name, sir. No, you have not. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, good afternoon and uh, a huge congratulations to, to Kolo. Uh, and to Fran uh, on a terrific uh, book. Uh, it's been great working with both of you and nice to be on this panel with Jonathan as well. Uh, so uh, my own chapter in this book really is a reflection on the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And while it may have been called the a critical appraisal of it, uh, it's really hopefully what is a fair assessment uh, that points to the potential challenges uh, that the implementation of the AFCFTA uh, will, will, will confront. Uh, the, the, uh, the celebration that met the, the conclusion of the agreement itself uh, and the actual effectiveness uh, of the same uh, meant that uh, we thought we have arrived at a place where this long sought vision of having a continental free trade area agreement uh, is, uh, is really, is at, is really taken off. Uh, what this chapter does really is actually to first uh, assess the AFCFTA for what it is uh, in terms of some of the core provisions of the agreement uh, and then uh, attempt to, to situate it in the context of challenges, uh, not just in the African context, uh, but as it relates to specifically regional economic communities that are existing uh, already, uh, dispute settlements that, uh, that those other regional economic communities have, uh, the challenges associated with which the AFCFT itself uh, was drafted, uh, being modeled significantly after the WTO regime, which has some level of complications once one thinks about the fact that African countries have hardly engaged with that uh, regime. Uh, and then the other one is to really uh, uh, engage a little bit, not as much as one would have loved, uh, with the challenges associated with the notion of pan-Africanism, uh, 
which seems to have, as I argued, been uh, associated with the AFCFT not enough in a critical manner. Uh, and what the chapter really seeks to do is to attempt to rely on existing works, particularly political scientists, uh, on ideas around Pan-Africanism and how nations uh, weaponize or instrumentalize, uh, if you like, this particular ideology uh, to suit national goals, uh, to at times pick on regional goals that work for them, uh, and really to just draw attention to the fact that the work has only just begun, uh, if we're serious about uh, an African continental free trade area agreement. Uh, so I do want to thank uh, Kolo again, uh, and Fran as well as you, uh, so Lisi, as well as the editors, they did a fantastic work. They've been kind enough to make the chapter pre-publication available to us. So uh, that's the link right there uh, for those attending who might be interested in going deeper into it. Otherwise, I'm happy to engage with the questions. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm, I'm really curious because I think in your um, summary, you, you alluded to one of my questions and with regards to the multiple sub-regional agreements and communities that already exist on the continent, I'm curious, how will the AFCFTA fit into this? Because there's already so many other organizations that exist on the continent. Um, and how will it fit and how will it be different? Will it add any value or will it also exhaust an already... <laughs> Um, yeah, over over exhausted system. Considering we've got so many regional communities and so many agreements amongst those regional communities. Yeah, thanks, uh, Zulisi. So, so I, the the FCFT is clear uh, in the sense that its uh, conclusion is not to uh, suppose that it immediately replaces all of the regional economic concepts. In fact, it is clear that it relies on the uh, existing body of law. Uh, that the regional economic communities have. And where, as understandably, the regional economic communities have advanced further where there are conflicts and the rules uh, developed by those regional economic communities uh, will prevail. Now, that is, in, that is very good. And, and I mean, to the extent that these, these are bodies that will support the AFCFT, it makes sense. The challenge, though, is in assuming that that, that process will naturally just work. Uh, and here, I'm careful again not to suggest uh, that within African states, it's in the context of intra-African trade that not much has been happening. So let's speak on the EAC and try to understand how even within those uh, uh, regions, we might have what we call the trade wars right, that go on. Usually when we mention this, we tend to think of the US, China, uh, UK, you know, European context. But African countries have that. You have series uh, of laws that are, you know, tariffs that, that are placed on milk, that are placed on products uh, that go across borders. You know, Ghana and Nigeria have had that for some time. South Africa and Nigeria have had it in relation to uh, to MTN, to, to different uh, organizations that have come into these countries. So really, in terms of how the AFCFT and the RECs work, the chapter really is pointing to those, if you like, not and bold hardcore questions. Uh, of what plays once we go to the granular context of how these activities will, will be played out. Uh, the core of trade that happens, uh, happens by the people that, that travel across these regions, that traverse these regions. And the reality is that there's still a lot more that has to be done, even at the regional level, that yes. if the AFCFTA does not pay attention to it, it risks buying in, in those challenges. Uh, yeah. and escalating them into the FCA. So I'm, I'm curious, you already alluded to the fact that even on a regional level, there are some lessons that we can learn. And I'm, do, do you know what some of those lessons are, perhaps from how some of the regional organizations have either functioned or malfunctioned over the years? So what are some of the lessons that we can sort of pick up and be aware of as we delve into this era of the AFCFTA? So that's a great question, right? Uh, and I think one of the first things I'll go back to Interestingly, it's even around the drafting of the agreement, right? We seem to have closed our eyes as a people uh, to an area we've developed so much jurisprudence, uh, you know, which interestingly there, I have the book right behind me here, my bookshelf, uh, the first African International Economic Law Network book, and the second one, which Francisca amongst others uh, co-edited, have written a lot on the jurisprudence that this 
communities, and I'm not about their courts right now, have developed. Granted, they haven't done enough in the area of trade hitherto, with the exception of a few, like Ohada. And so one key area is to ask ourselves, how might we, did we lose an opportunity, for example, uh, to look at what Comesa has done, at what EAC has done, at what OHADA has done, uh, to generate a regime that African countries feel comfortable with, that they don't feel threatened by their national economic policy space in really acceding to something that they really mean uh, and will work with. So that's one area which I think uh, we can, as we move ahead as a continent, about how those economic communities have functioned in those contexts. The other part is just really about dispute settlement, right? Uh, the notion that trade, trade uh, relations are low and don't happen amongst African countries, I think, is overemphasized, uh, simply because we don't just play into the informality of the context of trade, uh, which a lot of people have written about. And so I think that that's another area that is critical uh, for the AFCFT as we go ahead to turn its mind uh, to look at a third area, uh, and I will stop so that we can we can move ahead too, is really in relation to the design uh, of the dispute settlement regime. As it is, I'm very skeptical about the potential for it to reorganize or be, be instrumental uh, to the settlement of trade disputes. Uh, it's not to say that this form has to be done away with completely. One might imagine that they might expand the possibility of access. Uh, of those who can really use that system, right? Whereas in the context of regional economic communities, not all of them, ECOWAS particularly now, uh, you've seen expansion in both substantive jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction to include human rights and associated uh, issues. We need not go the human rights route here at the risk of turning it into something else, but we can open those who can come before uh, the panels and, you know, and make appeals so that those who actively trade, the private sector individuals can really use them as opposed to being uh, only statist in its orientation. Though those are some thoughts. There are more certainly one can talk about, uh, but but I hope those those are helpful. No, those those are really helpful and very interesting. Uh, we, if we had more time, I would actually inquire about the, the last two that you mentioned. I think it's really important, considering that there's a large part of the economy that is informal in the African context. And I sometimes wonder if by us, in many ways, taking inspiration from the WTO agreements, whether or not we've accounted enough for the informal economy. But um, I don't, I don't know if you've got like just a short minute of thought for that. Do, have we accounted enough? How, how, should we, how, what else can we do to accommodate the informal economy that dominates African markets? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question. And I think it's always good to, to, to caveat that no one has all the answers for it, right? Because of the heterogeneity of this beautiful continent uh, that is Africa. So let me speak to the little that I know about Nigeria and cross-border trade. Uh, and the ECOWAS context where I have focused a lot more. And I've written a little bit more about this recently in the Chicago Journal of International Law. I think what needs to be done is certainly not formalization. Uh, I think what we've seen in maybe not deliberate, perhaps deliberate to some extent, on the estimation of the type of trade we have as a people. And if you go back to the fact that we didn't have borders in the way we recognize them legally now, then you understand the nature of our trade and how we are probably, and, and, you know, Fran was joking about this, that we need future projects to do. Uh, we need to do more empirical work. We all need, including me, to be skilled in doing, some of us probably do already, uh, in really going to the field and accounting for how these trades occur. Some scholarship now exists, right, that try to enrich our understanding of these trades happen. Those are we need to document. And really, it's a bottom-up bottom -up approach. So I, I won't, I won't be, I won't pretend and be the armchair professor who sits here and tells those, tell those informal traders how to, how to think about it. We need to understand the phenomenon more and how, in its multiple ways, it carries out. And then I think, with the benefits of those kind of uh, experiential knowledge, we can, we can theorize and write and move it forward. Thank you for that. Thank you so much um, for your contributions and your reflections. We really appreciate them. And hopefully those that sit in seats of power will listen to this podcast and this webinar at some point later on and be influenced. Um, so, Ms. Kugler, 
we are ready for your contributions. Can you hear us? Yes. Um, yes, I can hear. No, I, I'm struggling to hear you, Ms. Kugler. Um, Mrs. Apologies. I'm struggling to hear you. I can also not hear her. So yeah. I think it's a, I'm not sure about Jonathan, but I think she's back. She's back. Am I back? Can you? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Hmm. Okay, perhaps whilst we wait for Ms. Kugler, Prof. Suka, do you want to perhaps do your session before hers while she's fixing her connectivity? Unfortunately, we always have to uh, be malleable and move with the times in the times of technology. And Liz? Um, that's, that's fine. Um, that's the second time I'm getting surprised here because um, <laughs> my co-author for the chapter that I uh, wanted to just quickly introduce, Brandon Vickers, uh, also on short notice yesterday evening said that he can't be here. Um, I nevertheless um, uh, sent his apologies. He was very keen of engaging here and has a meeting, I think Commonwealth Foreign Affairs Minister meeting where he has to represent uh, as a lead trade policy officer there. So that is of course more important than a book launch. I understand that. Um, but yeah, I should uh, convey my apologies. So what Brendan and I did um, is tackling the question of WTO decision making, mm -hmm. which is uh, a delicate one because um, it's uh, determining the functioning and legitimacy of the WTO somehow um, and it's an advancement uh, in uh, new issues. So we did that with a focus of uh, African participation and so to speak, increasing African participation and agenda setting, um, and that in a very uh, confident and assertive way. So this is um, what we're trying to do. Um, how do we do that? Um, maybe to say at the same time that Africa's um, participation increases and in agenda setting, uh, we have more and more difficulty to actually uh, uh, come to decisions at the WTO level. Um, that has to do with growing numbers as an obvious, but more so about uh, more broader and diverse issues that have to be uh, decided upon. And then, of course, also the, the increasing participation of players that have not participated before and, and uh, want to now contribute and also be heard uh, with their issues. So what we did in the chapter is to, uh, to separate between rules and uh, practice uh, quite uh, distinctively in order to show what are the actual rules that were agreed upon in the agreements, what are the challenges with regards to the rules, um, and what are the practices that members, uh, how, how are they doing it? Because there's always this, this notion, the member-driven organization. So, so that is a very important part of the WTO. So that's what we're doing in the chapter, um, looking at um, that um, decision-making has become more transparent and inclusive, despite some uh, still some criticism that this is not so, but what the challenges still are. And also with a focus on um, consensus, the role of consensus and um, what it actually does and prevents and what role voting plays. So uh, maybe as an introduction to the chapter, I leave it there, yeah? yeah. Thank you, Prof. Sukha, for that. I, I think you, you you said something that I think is really important, the distinction between the rules and the DSU and the practice that's been established over the years, that there's a clear distinction between the two. And it's on that that I really want to ask you my first question, right, is whether or not WTO members have failed to follow the actual decision-making processes and rules contained in the DSU um, over the years. And, and And what comes to mind is, the consensus v voting issues because there are instances where um, members are allowed to vote however they preferred and their preference over the years is always to resort to uh, consensus building and consensus building in an organization that is growing um, becomes difficult because each country has its own diverse interests and each member has its own interests and so do the different groups so is it, has there been a failure on members to really follow the rules to the letter 
uh, when it comes to, to um, decision making? That's really the heart of my question. Well, it's it depends on how one interprets the actual rule. So um, if one reads it like extremely uh, black letter law, uh, it says if consensus has not been achieved, voting shall be, so they shall continue to vote. So the shell is very clear as an obligation. So, but the question is, when uh, when does what, when has consensus not been achieved? Yes. So, so, so I think that is the tricky part to to actually uh, uh, find a, a a solution. I mean, with regards to not appointing appellate body members and blocking it from the U.S., it is very clear that consensus has not been achieved because uh, we stuck there. But with other things, you could always also think maybe they are not finished with the negotiations, right? You could always argue and say, no, no, it's not yet not achieved. We are still busy negotiating. So the question is, is there a determining moment where you have to say this has now not been achieved? But with some, I would actually argue that there, that has been inconsistent because nothing has happened thereafter. So yes. if nothing has happened thereafter, actually it is inconsistent because voting um, should have been according to the rules employed. But that is very, very seldomly the case in practice. Um, that has, of course, political reasons and all sorts of reasons um, that one wants to take everyone on board. But um, whether that is inconsistent the way they have acted is is really a question of definition when that moment is actually uh, achieved. So I'm not. But there were uh, several parts of your question. So I, I focus now first on the whether they have failed uh, or not acted inconsistent. No, but I think the several rephrasing of my question really you got to the oh, heart I see. of it or not. <laughs> and I think that's really <laughs> crucial. But the question is then moving forward, what do we do? Because I think we have, and, and you alluded to it, we've established certain practices where you sort of become constrained by those practices that we've established. So do we then encourage members to now follow the voting procedures and the law, the, the, the law as is, or do what's the way forward? Because I think the crisis of the appellate body is a good example as to, we've, because of this practice we've established, no one now wants to make the hard and difficult decision of voting. Or well, voting truth vote. be told, it's not just the appellate body that always is, is used as an example where that actually uh, does come to a standstill. So Doha is a very, uh, 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 the Doha round and the stalemate is, is prominent, but also smaller decisions like um, South Africa and India who block uh, a lot of things at the moment, or, or th th it's not just about the proposal of the waiver that they they also uh, are very much against uh, negotiations <clears throat> on e-commerce or trade facilitation. And they argue that actually with consensus, which is a weird thing because uh, when you want to continue with the TRIPS waiver, they actually, if they, if, want to be successful probably would have to go for voting. So that's a very interesting development in how they position themselves to not be contradictory in their approaches, um, which I find interesting in, in the in the uh, in the future. But what are we doing? I mean, at the moment, what it leads to is plurilateral uh, negotiations. So this is what we have. Uh, and that leads um, in some areas to to um, moving forward on those issues, at least. Right. So do we want to prevent that? I'm not sure. Sometimes I think just let them negotiate because they obviously would like to negotiate. Then let them do that. Um, it is a fear, though, for African countries or for those countries that are not part of it because they're not uh, influencing the rules. Um, and that's the same thing. Please, I see you, you have a question. I do, I do. I, I'm really curious because I think Prof. Akin Kobe made a really interesting point uh, in his uh, earlier reflections about the fact that I much of the dis dispute settlement and the decision making of the FCFTA mirrors that of the um, WTO. And I'm wondering, do you think perhaps the emergence of the FCFTA and, and, and African countries being more active there will probably mean that they'll be less interested in the decision making process at the WTO, that all of a sudden in South Africa and the likes who have been blocking certain decisions over the years, will then dissuade from that and, and redirect their focus to the continental issues. 
I think to a part, but only to to have a basis for negotiating then at the WTO level. So um, I think it can be used. It can be useful, though. I mean, uh, uh, we will not get uh, uh, so far, for example, on e-commerce or whatever. But if they have a discussion on the e-commerce protocol in the AFCFTA, they might get uh, like a consensus on what the majority of African countries kind of like would like to see in such an agreement and then could bring that in there. I don't know, but I don't, obviously they will focus on the AFCFTA, but I don't think that it will distract from the importance of the WTO for African countries. Uh, that will just be a complementary thing because what are African countries trade with? It, 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 at the moment, the AFCFTA is there to, to in, increase intra-African trade, but at but but the major trading partners are not amongst Africa. So look at South Africa, it's the European Union, it's China, it's the US. Um, and yes, then comes other African countries, but that has to be built up first. So therefore, it's very important uh, how you position yourself at the WTO and that will not change. And um, just as a last point, their multilateralism is important for for African countries. These are mainly small countries and um, the power play in terms of bargaining power is bigger at multilateral level. So there might be also the, the thought of thinking about how to define consensus differently than it is at the moment, because at the moment it's kind of like just either or or not. So there can be other ways of, of saying this is consensus. It's a, it's a question of definition. And to just be against it, like South Africa, I think that's the wrong way. They should rather uh, propose how, wh what consensus means, maybe differently to achieve the same purpose, uh, to not have this drive into plurilateralism and maybe keep a little bit more multilateral uh, decisions. That would be. Uh, my thank answer. you. For, thank you for that, Prof. Uh, Suka. Thank you for your reflections. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that we welcome questions. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box and then we will respond to them either during or ask some of those questions to the panelists as we speak or at the end. Um, Mrs. Kugler, I use your connection better now. Can you hear and see us perfectly? Yes. You know, technology tripped me up. <laughs> I, was, I was on my desk, web, uh, a desktop at work on my laptop. So anyway, VPN. Anyway, long story short, I'm back. Um, thank you very much, and I'm sorry for that. Um, I wanted to make a comment on what uh, you've just mentioned about the pallet body because my chapter is on dispute settlement. Actually, the pallet body situation is actually different from the general decision making because actually in the DSU, uh, all the sort of decision and less for specific ones should be made by consensus. So there is no specific for the pallet body an option to vote. And yes, so unless yes. the DSU is amended, then we will have the, the same sort of problem forever. But uh, let me not get ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm just going to give a quick summary of my of my chapter. Um, so, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Saraya Mwangi uh, that has made to this chapter because this is a project that we embarked on together. And unfortunately, at the end, um, she could not participate anymore, but her contributions have been immense. And so this is one thing that I would like to mention, although my name is the only one that appears there. Uh, so Maria Mwangi really uh, did a lot of work on this chapter and thank you for that. But it's it's very much a sort of a traditional dispute settlement uh, chapter, WTO dispute settlement chapter, the first part of it and most part of it. And so if somebody is looking to learn about how the dispute settlement mechanism works at the WTO, um, about the processes, about the procedures, about the steps, I think this is a chapter that really covers comprehensively those proceedings and, and, and also highlights the most important cases. So um, it's really, uh, you know, sort of based on WTO dispute settlement proceedings and then going into the African um, regional and sort of African participation. Why is that? Because African countries have not participated much in trade or investment or economic disputes inter, sort of in the regional, so inter, inter regionally and also at the WTO. So what do we have at the WTO for African countries? So far, we've had um, four countries that have participated. So we have Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and South Africa. South Africa has had um, six requests for, this, uh, for consultations. All of them have been um, trade remedies. And interestingly, all of the African countries have only actually been involved in anti-dumping disputes at the WTO. Um, the latest on South Africa was in 2015, Pakistan, which is actually DS500. 
uh, on Portland Cement. Uh, all of South Africa's disputes did not go ahead. They were settled uh, before they went to panel. But we have a sort of Egypt uh, mm -hmm. steel rebar and also a panel and a panel report for the Morocco um, textbook case against Tunisia. Interestingly, it is against Tunisia. It is an intra-Africa dispute. Both countries are part of the Maghreb Union, but they took the dispute to the WTO. So this shows actually the importance of the WTO dispute settlement system, even within African countries in the African context. And, you know, the way that it is not functioning optimally right now, not only affects, of course, the big players that use it, like the US and the EU and China, but also affects African countries now, um, because this dispute was uh, appealed by Morocco. And right now it's just sitting in limbo. Um, and also I highlight, of course, so uh, African countries do not participate as main parties, but they do participate as third parties. And there have been 18 countries, about 18 to 20 countries so far that have done so. In three main disputes, it would be the EC bananas and the EC sugar, and also most recently the Australian plain packaging one. The EC disputes, obviously because of you know the Lome and the Cotonou agreements where African countries or ACP countries had preferences into the EC market or EU market, and of course, that those were deemed to be discriminatory. And also the subsidies that the EU gave um, to, to, to the sugar pro uh, products as well. Um, and so also, not only just, of course, in the disputes, but also African, can, or African people or people who are Africans participating in as, you know, DS chairs, uh, chairs of the DSU review, as panelists, actually, we had Leora Bloomberg uh, last week, who's, you know, one actually of the most sort of quite frequently used panelists, and she's African, she's South African and Australian, and also just highlighting how African countries are really instrumental into getting support um, at the WTO in dispute settlement, and also ultimately sort of nudging the direction of the advisory center on WTO law, where our work, which was established in 2001, to really support countries um, in dispute settlement. And then just generally on the regional front, as I said to you, there's not much that has happened in terms of economic law disputes. There have been two, one at Comesa and one at EAC. And as we know, sort of economically also, then we go to SADC, and that's been the whole sort of uh, Campbell, uh, I guess, saga that led to the disbandment, the disbandment of, the, of the SADC tribunal, unfortunately. And my the chapter concludes with the AFCFT dispute settlement mechanism, as BCS has explained, it's very much modeled on the WTO dispute settlement. I mean, almost you know, copy paste. There's a few differences that I've noted, um, and you know, the question that you've also raised, Nicholas, is what is the value add? You know, and I would like to sort of pitch sort of <laughs> myself. I, I've written an article about. It basically says the success of the AFCFT dispute settlement mechanism depends on giving access to private parties. Mm -hmm. And I write about why is that? Mm -hmm. And I write about what ways this can happen. Um, so it's coming out in the journals of Global Customs and Trade Journal um, at the end of this year. So if you're interested in looking, reading about that, please do not hesitate. Thank you, may I ask you to stop there for a second? Um, yes, I'm, I'm done. There's a bit of an echo, I don't know if it's far. I, I'm curious because something you said earlier, but it's also that classic line that's always said that the DS, the dispute settlement system is the jewel of the system, the jewel of the crown of the WTO. And I'm wondering now, in light of this crisis that we're experiencing, do we think that the system will ever go back to functioning the way that it was? And should it function the way that it was for years? <laughs> this is the question, right? So, will it go back and should it function the way that it, it did over the years? Yeah, I mean, the, the, these are questions that have been sort of, you know, questions back and forth in the past two years. Personally, I mean, it's my own personal opinion. I don't think it'll ever go back to the way it was. I, I really don't think so, because I think for some of the users, and I'm going to name the U.S., because, you know, the U.S. has been really sort of in the center of all of this, you know, debacle. Uh, it really wasn't serving its needs. Although the U.S. has been the number one user of the system, and although the U.S. has won <laughs> the majority of its cases, but some of the decisions, you know, in the zeroing and anti-dumping, in the way that, you know, some sort of subsidies are defined, uh, the U.S. did not find that to be serving their interests. And, you know, overreach, you know, it goes on. I mean, this is a whole, like, story. Like, there's a whole chapter you can write about this. 
And so I think that no, I don't think that it, the, the appellate body is ever going to go back to the way that it, sh it was and should it probably not, if really it was problematic, then, you know, a lot of members, and it's not only the U.S., the U.S. just seems to be, you know, in the center and also the poster child. Um, a lot of the members agreed that some of the things should change. So I think no. Do you have any ideas of how it should function? So you... You know, I mean, I don't. And, and, sorry, before before I even let you answer, and I'm I'm thinking here, considering the fact that we have mirrored the the, the appellate mm -hmm. the, the appellate body in our own agreements in this in the African Free Continental Trade Agreement, sort of mirrored it. And so, should it function differently? And like, do you have any ideas as to that as well? Bearing that in mind, mm -hmm. I mean, I think for me, and and you know, I have all of a sudden this freedom to say my mind because. <laughs> I'm now a doctoral researcher. <laughs> um, I think there is an element of truth in how much accountability the AB has or does not have to the DSB, the disbesettlement body. And I think there should be more of a conversation with the disbesettlement body, especially with regards to extending timelines of cases. Um, towards the end, the appellate body was just saying that we're going to extend the timeline and not really consulting with the DSB or necessarily with the parties. And I think if it's a member led, you know, organization and the DSB is ultimately the head of the DSB settlement um, system, you know, some sort of consultation at least should happen. So maybe that's one thing that could change. And as for in the African context, um, it's very unfortunate. And I mean, it's not a mis it's not sort of by, you know, default. I think a lot of RTAs look like the WTO DSP settlement system and look like WTO agreements. So it's not only Africa, right? It's not just Africa that has this, you know, quote unquote mm -hmm. problem. But I think what's very unique in Africa is that um, we don't even use the DSP settlement systems anyway. So, I mean, why do we copy, you know, like it doesn't make sense. So we have it, it's nice, but we don't use it, you know? And if we don't use it, is there a problem? You know, I think this is a question we should be asking. Is there a problem with the rules? Like, do we need to have different rules? Should we be considering other means of dispute settlement? Should we really be pushing alternative means of dispute settlement? You know, good offices, conciliation, mediation, all of that. And maybe we should, you know, maybe really we should. And I think we really need to look, you know, long and hard at ourselves and look at the AFCFTA and look at the, the REC dispute settlement mechanism and ask, are they serving the people that they're meant to serve? And for me right now, it's a big no. And so um, I think that's really the next, you know, dispute settlement frontier for Africa. Um, how do we, you know, create systems that work for the people that trade? Interesting. I, I think I was gonna ask, the next question I was going to ask is whether the system, i.e. the dispute settlement system has worked for African countries and developing countries. But I think you sort of alluded to that, right? That you know what it had, you know, the dispute system of the WTO hasn't been a dud. Let's not put it that way. You know, it's been a dud in the past two years. So let's really be real. It's been really one of the most, and if not the most, prolific and successful multilateral dispute settlement mechanism in the world by far. I've got stats, you know. So it has worked for the countries that have used it. It has worked, you know, for countries like India, for countries like China. You know, the Latin American countries use it actively between themselves even. Mm. They don't use their own dispute settlement systems. They go to the WTO. It's worked for Vietnam and Indonesia. You know, I can name a lot of countries. So it's not, it hasn't been useless. It just, at this juncture, and I think also politically in the U.S., what's happening, it happened during the Trump regime. Yes, criticism started way back, you know, in Clinton's regime and Bush 1's regime. But it really sort of came to a when Trump was in power. So obviously this is just not in a vacuum, but also you have to think about the political climate in which this whole thing happened. And I think Trump being in, in power sort of emboldened the US to take the steps that they did. Thank you. I just wanted, I wanted to pose to maybe Fran, if she's got an idea before we move on to Prof Claren for competition, because I think we've got a bit more time. So I'm gonna use my own flexibilities as a moderator here. I have a question that I think perhaps the two of you could answer in conjunction one another, because I think it, it sort of stands between decision-making and dispute settlement. Uh, with regard to like some of the issues we've experienced over the last few years, some around the DSU, I'm wondering, have they been not, are those not if, as a result of the failure of the negotiating arm of the WTO that because the negotiating arm has sort of been stagnant over the years, then, for example, members 
would have taken things that they would traditionally take to negotiation to dispute settlement and or then used certain or failed to implement certain voting procedures because ordinarily this is stuff that they would be, that would be done under negotiations. So I'm wondering the stagnancy of the negotiations, what it's what's the impact that it has on some of from the crisis that we've had. I don't know if the question is clear and if it mm -hmm. I think I'll leave Fran to actually uh, respond to that because I think it, it falls sort of squarely in your bracket, but I'm going to make one comment. A lot of members, including the U.S., said that, you know, the appellate body has become a rulemaking institution, you know, and because, the you know, the functions of courts, according to sort of international law, is to interpret the treaty and to interpret what the members, you know, have agreed upon and not to necessarily make rules. And then I'll, I'll leave it to Fran. So, while while Fran answers that, Kolo, please look in the comments. There's been a question by Mr. Nzimande that reads as follows, that I think you might want to think about in the interim. Has Kolo looked into why African states are not using the WTO dispute settlement? That's a very important question that will come back to you after Professor Claren. Yes. Um, so, Fran, quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, Akolo has looked into that question, so she can answer that. Um, but um, well, it's op that obviously goes together exactly. So uh, rulemaking in, at the decision level, we we all know the separation of powers. Um, that sounds now uh, that that speaks to normal constitution usually, but I mean that's here the same. If you have rules written down and then uh, they are created and that is not supposed to be, then uh, and then there are tensions and that's exactly what happened here, right? Because specifically, I think, Kolo, if I'm not mistaken, in the area of anti-dumping and uh, those kind of, there, there were kind of like uh, a bit of a strain in terms of the rules, but I mean, um, how judicial activism or how they called it, right? So. Um, negotiation, you cannot negotiate that. So, so, so the, the, the system is made like every rule that comes into place has been to, ne has to be negotiated in those rounds, right? Mm -hmm. And whether you apply the single undertaking approach that has always done, or then you move away a bit like it was then done in Bali or Nairobi, that doesn't matter. You still have to agree on it at the time, even if it, whether it's on the, in a large negotiation round or simply on the rules like the ban of export subsidies in agriculture, right? So, so the decision making and whether you you follow consensus or not um, is um, it ties in with negotiations. If I can maybe make one more comment to that, because you asked me earlier about the AFCFTA and what they said in consensus. Right. I looked it up because you alerted it to me and they actually don't define it and it's actually different. And so if you look at the AFCFTA, they say, yes, we follow consensus or oh, that's our principle. They have not the option like in the WTO that if it's not achieved, we shall have voting. They have not the same rule. Plus, they don't define consensus at all in the agreement, which is a good thing because you can now define it and actually fill it out in a different way than in a WTO, but there is no obligation to the voting system. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Claren, um, please take to the floor. OK, great. Um, so you can hear me now, MX, yeah? OK. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you very much. OK, well, thank you. Um, so I just want to say, yeah, thank you for um, setting up this um, webinar and the chance to interact with these four thinkers that includes you, MX, as well as um, Professor Akanube, who's now um, gone. Um, but yeah, and also I want to say thanks to the, I'm going to say three institutions, because as you noted, MX, it's the Mandela Institute that's here. Um, and then I think, yeah, BC's work and Afronomics is really an institution in itself. Um, hopefully one of us can put the um, web address for Afronomics Law into the chat. And um, yeah, and I think um, it's really wonderful to have these scholars there who are really interacting with um, some of the law schools in Africa and, and other institutions also. But finally, this book is an institution itself. <laughs> I mean, just the fact that Colo and Fran, you know, that we've had to do three webinars and, you know, just how big the thing is. 
et cetera. But um, yeah, it's not the place to worry about it or mention too much, but it's really an achievement. And uh, I think it is an institution in the sense of, you know, really having an impact going forward. So uh, congratulations, and I'm so pleased to be a part of it. MX, I'm sure you mentioned, but just to remind everyone, I did this chapter together with Fran, Prof. Zucker, who's here. So I'm going to call in on her whenever you trap me with uh, piercing questions. Um, but I really did enjoy the chance to do the chapter. Um, I think, you know, maybe it, it might be seen in a way to differ from some of the others in the book in that um, it's really got a, a, a definite element of bottom up in the sense of competition as a, you know, largely domestic regime, um, it, which, you know, can be seen to differ from some of the other realms of international economic law. Um, what we did in the chapter, um, and it really was very much a we, I think, back and forth, um, Fran can say whatever she wants there, um, that, uh, yeah, we talked about several, um, there's really several kind of multiplicities there. One is trade and competition. So this is very much one of the trade and areas. Um, we also did, as I've already kind of referred to, multilateral regional, like for instance, AFCFTA that um, BC was speaking about, and national. So we're, you know, we really tried to play three-dimensional chess at, um, yeah, at all of those levels. And we also, yeah, we needed to work out and put into the chapter for the analysis, not just the rules, but also the enforcement. And, and even to some extent prior to that, some of the activity, the political economy. So it, it, it really was ambitious in that sense. And um, like most works of ambition that are only a chapter, it doesn't cover everything, but um, we did get some of it in there. So. What did we look at? We looked, tried to think about how in the current moment of globalization or global economic activity, how we saw a rise of these sort of distorting or anti-competitive activities, um, collusion, cartels, uh, the kinds of mergers, consolidation and concentration, and what we call in domestic abuse of dominance. Um, so we thought that that really was a good time to give a perspective from Southern Africa on um, where trade and competition and the interface between the two, uh, what sort of perspective there was there. Because as we've already mentioned elsewhere or earlier in this webinar, African countries are relatively small and maybe we haven't pulled this through so much yet that the economic sectors well, you talked about an informal economy, but there's lots of players that are small and medium enterprises, really, if we if we take a global look and, and even if we take a, um, a national look. So it's a distinctive um, kind of economic positioning, and we thought that it was important to take a look at it. Um, so yeah, so what did we do? We played at each one of those three levels and talked about trade and competition and the interaction you know, the big picture is that when you look at multilateral, there's not a whole lot there. There are minimum procedural rules from international trade, but, you know, we're not taking a Singapore negotiation approach here. So it's not a, um, or back to Havana Charter, et cetera. It's not the competition down. It's really how these different levels interact. We pointed to, um, unlike Colo, we didn't have lots of stats, but um, we did have a number of cases, case studies, and we did point to, I think, some interesting areas which were um, tensions between the multilateral uh, trade and the domestic competition regime um, to think about ways in which some of these cross-border distortions were caught and others were not caught, maybe even facilitated as opposed to enforced. Um, we thought about um, and had some examples about places where this regime was, yeah, a legal regime, but actually creating uncertainty rather than 
you know, reducing it, which is, of course, what lawyers mostly think they're doing. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we spoke to particular gaps, um, places where there really were, um, and we even kind of distinguished between types of gaps, but regulatory gaps. And we were thinking particularly there of, um, um, yeah, African uh, areas. So I think I'll leave it there. It's a, it's very much a work in, well, I don't know if Fran would say this. I mean, I'm, in one way we are, we're finished, but it is also a work in project, in progress, in the sense that it's an area that the developments are happening quite fast. But perhaps you, you, you left it on, thank you for your reflections, but of the gaps that exist, particularly in the African context, Perhaps you could allude to those gaps, uh, bearing in mind that currently we're negotiating, uh, essentially in the, Af in the African Free Continental Free Trade Agreement, a uh, competition um, thingy. Um, so I'm wondering what, where, where you think, what role we should uh, factor that in, considering some of those gaps as we negotiate. Um, yeah, well, I think that is being factored into those negotiations, which you know, isn't directly the topic of our chapter, but insofar as we would talk about gaps that are there, we follow, um, I guess, to some extent, research and analysis by um, Eleanor Fox and Moore Bakum, um, noting how in some of the areas, uh, in some of the regions, West African being one of them, where from the point of view of having effective competition regulation, that the overlap between a regional level and a national level can actually preclude competition regulation. So in that area, um, the regional body is effectively creating a gap. So there's a, um, a jurisdictional gap that has um, ar arguably wasn't there, but national is being precluded. That, I think, should be distinguished from, and this would be important, MX, for, you know, the negotiation kind of work, from what you might call, you know, just at least colloquially, true gaps. So if you think of um, a Congo or a DRC, or we give some other examples of um, jurisdictions where there is, um, there are no potentially applicable um, competition regimes, um, ex except for ones I suppose you could create very creatively, as we know lawyers can be. So um, we think most of the time about maybe the second type of gaps, because there's a, um, there's a prospect that through the um, regional um, AFCFTA, et cetera, we can fill in those gaps with regional law. But I think we need to think about the first one as well, because there's where we're, to use the terminology, creating the problem, uh, as well as maybe alleviating them. But then one wonders then, is there a need for multilateral competition rules? Like, you know, is, is it, if you've identified that once you create these bodies, essentially, then you also you create certain crises and blocks. So crisis of your own creation, do we then need a, an overarching multilateral system uh, globally on this on this matter? Well, she then nodded. After you, may Fran pitch in because her face is um, interesting, um, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, I, I think let's bring Fran in here because some of her other research, particularly in the area of cultural activities, et cetera, was addressing this and also, yeah, Fran, can we pass off to you on that one? We can. I think if you have a regional uh, regional competition law, national competition law is extremely important at those levels, right? But the problem is that it only disciplines properly the, un the anti-competitive behavior within that region. Yeah. Um, so therefore, if it is cross-border regions, you end up with the same problem that we in the article described at the very beginning. In other words, we described what happens in, a, in an economic system like the global one, where there are no competition rules. In other words, where private, economic private behavior is not disciplined. But at the same time, the state um, 
the state activities are disciplined in terms of um, um, reduction of tariffs and barriers and, 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 and trade limits. So you still have the same problem that you have an economic system where some global corporations, and that is mainly those multinational corporations who are acting not within a region or just within a domestic system, can do basically in some instances what they want if the re regional or domestic uh, system doesn't capture that behavior. So therefore, it would be required for those cross-border activities. Thank you for that, Fran. Um, Carla, do you want to answer the question that we had left with you a few minutes ago before I take another question from um, audience? You are mute. You are mute. Please unmute yourself. I think in the second year of the pandemic, we've, we we figured out the mute button. But anyway, um, so there there have been some you know there's been some research as to why African countries don't use the WTO disbursement uh, mechanism, and and the, this has been sort of the responses. Um, one is expense. Um, Although I guess when you can compare to baby investor state DSP settlement, uh, WTO DSP settlement is, is cheaper, but it's still very expensive. I mean, it can run into the millions or million of dollars um, just for, you know, a panel sort of consultation to panel process. Of course, I put in the, in, in, in the box the ACWL, uh, the organization for which I am working or on sabbatical from. Uh, you know, uh, has really tried to 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 cut those fees. Uh, you know, very very low. For example, if an LDC were to get involved from consultation level to appellate body level, that'd be about forty thousand US dollars. You know, so that's just a fraction of what it would cost if they would go to a, a normal commercial law firm. Another issue is capacity, and I mean, obviously, throughout the years, I think a lot of capacity has been built in Africa. You know, a lot of African countries know the agreements inside out, uh, but also capacity in terms of if we were to dedicate our resources, meaning human resources to this case, we won't have anybody dealing with other matters that are, you know, the trade, the trade files, because there's limited, you know, physical sort of human resource capacity as well. Another issue that was brought up is that there's sometimes very bad communication in, in, in African countries within sort of the, 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 the industry and the government. So the industry is not well organized to lobby government enough for them to take up their case to the WTO. So without that level of pressure and engagement, the governments really don't know. They aren't aware sometimes because some, you know, in some African countries, there they aren't any sort of, you know, trade, trade associations, et cetera, et cetera, that would take upon the industry's cause and really, you know, communicate to the government. Another, so I'm going to uh, mention two Just, last things. Okay, please, because I have a yeah. very long question that I need to ask to the panel. So I may ask everyone to stay for an additional five to 10 minutes so that this, this is an important question. Okay, sorry, the last, the last one is political pressure. Um, this was really seen in, in, in this, the Cotton 4 case, the U.S. Upland Cotton, where uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, and, and, and Mali potentially could have participated as main parties, but they didn't in the end because apparently there was some political pressure from the U.S. not to get involved. <laughs> and as you can imagine, there's some African countries which development aid makes up a majority of their income. And without the development aid, the country does not function. So obviously, if they were to bring a dispute against one of their biggest trading partners, they would have actual like, you know, financial repercussions. And last but not least is the inability for small economies to retaliate when the bigger economies do not comply. And so this would be some of the issues, some of the uh, reasons why African countries have not and Mr. Uh, Lionel, I think you've switched yourself on. Um. Ma, okay. Uh, Kolo, are you done? Thank you. Uh, I just have one question, and it's a very long question. Could the panel please answer it, perhaps? I don't know, in, in whatever order you guys prefer. It goes as follows. With reference to the presentation by Professor Akin Kube, unfortunately he isn't here, but so 
Can someone explain what is meant by informal trading between African states? The Ms. Nzimanda says he battles to understand why it is not possible to measure such trade if goods are moved through normal borders and are declared to custom authorities as they should. Formalization is important for this reason alone, is it not? Um, trade in certain in second hand goods such as cars, clothing, textiles, footwear, and leather products is as destructive to the to the industrialization of the sectors. In my view, should it not be in my view, it should not be encouraged. What are the panel's thoughts? So the first question is with regards to whether or not uh, what is meant by informal trading, because is there ever such a thing as informal trading, considering that if a product moves from A to country A to country B, that product has to go through some sort of formalized process at the border where you declare to customs, and isn't that a, a form of formalization? That's the first question. The second is linked to um, second-hand products, um, such as goods, cars, and he's asking that should we not discourage this because it damages uh, industrialization in the sectors. So I don't know who wants to take uh, those questions. Um, I can I can start, but um, there are certainly not. Uh, I'm not a um, expert uh, in exactly informal trade, uh, cross-border trading. Um, however. Uh, it would be, by the way, and uh, BZ said it earlier that we want to continue this project. One of uh, in chapters in the next uh, edition uh, on informal cross-border trading. We at least plan so. So uh, just to 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 chuck that in here. Informal cross-border trading actually relates to uh, traders, unregistered traders, um, small, more vulnerable traders who trade in a very proximity over um, over a border. Um, so that is the very so so the classical uh, informal trader is a woman who crosses um, from Ghana to Benin every day over the border with her uh, mangoes or uh, any kind of products to sell them there without actually being seen as such. So when she crosses the border, it's not really seen as product. So that's why the custom question and that kind of thing that falls away. So, and it is maybe also to highlight mostly a sector where um, I think it's 80% or so uh, that actually women uh, uh, work or not work in that because I mean, it's informal, but um, and, mm, gain some kind of income. So that's why it's informal because they are not registered and have to pay nowhere um, any type of what we usually see as custom. So that's why, um, I said I'm not an expert in that, but I don't think that uh, busy means that it can be, it can't be measured. It could be measured if we formalize it. I think what he means to say is that we don't want to formalize it at the time because it it would destroy a lot of um, a lot of employment for many vulnerable people. Um, I don't know what the others would like to say to that, but in, with regards to cars or such kind of products, they are not part of this informal trading definition. So, I, yeah. Prof. Claren had, are you done with your response? Oh, I'm always done whenever moderator asks me to. <laughs> I appreciate that. Prof. Claren, your response before you go to Ms. Kugler. Can Mr. Lionel, please switch his camera off. Thank you very much. Martha, uh, please, if you can assist in this regard, I've sent you a message. Okay. So, um, yeah, as the member on the panel who was born in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm also not going to exactly speak to the definition, um, although there's plenty of informal trading in Boston. Um, but um, I guess the two things I'd say are that... The question's important. It also, Mr. Mzamande, Mzamande went on to be speaking or to bringing in industrial policy, which um, I think is important. The two things I'd say is that we nuance, um, I, I would argue for nuancing in the in understanding of industrialization and industrial policy concerns of competition. But the kinds of concerns of competition and competitiveness that that Fran and I are talking about, which is to say ones that are played out at national, regional, and to whatever extent also at multilateral level. 
Um, I guess the other part would go, and this would pretty much support what Fran just said, that, um, yeah, you know, competition, the, the competition will count um, secondhand goods. That's often an important part of the dynamics of markets. So, um, yeah, it, um, it's just, it's a bit like she was saying, it's not a choice of ignoring it. It's really a, are you making a choice to effectively allow this market to continue this production really or not? I just have a very quick comment on informal trade and then I'll also just say very something very quickly on also the second part. I mean, I can talk from my experience because <laughs> I, I live close to a border. So there are many times when I go shopping across the border in France uh, for my own purposes. And I do not declare those goods because <laughs> there's, you know, like it's stuff that I've bought. And I think when you're talking about sort of very, very small scale traders who just buy things across the border and cross the border, there's maybe a lot of trade that is not captured in that way because it's not declared. It should be declared, of course, and I agree with you. And if it was sort of, I guess, legitimate or sort of lawful in that way, it would be captured in, in you know, trade data, but some of it just goes undetected. And so in that way, I mean, I can see in a very limited way, some of this trade just, you know, sort of disappearing because it's not captured, it's not declared at customs. The second one, I'm just gonna raise an issue of sort of what Jonathan said and also about consumer welfare as to whether elimination of secondhand trade may cause in some countries, consumers not to be able to afford certain things. And I know in South Africa, secondhand cars is not an issue, but in the rest of Africa it is. And so it's also an issue of about of affordability. And I do agree, it is very much industrial policy and it's also very much how, you know, governments want to protect, you know, infant industries or, you know, very strategic in industries. But, you know, I don't have a, an, an answer to that. I don't know if it should be banned or not. I think it should be regulated, I agree, because some, you know, especially in Ghana and I know in, in East Africa, there was an issue with clothing. Um, but whether it should be completely eliminated is something that I, I do not know and I cannot speak to. That's it. Unmute. We can't hear you. Sorry, thank you. Oh, I've been doing so well. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not a panelist, but I have, a slight, I have an opinion on the last question, which I sometimes think we need to contemplate. Um, as someone who, who used to do something that Polo used to, does when I lived in Geneva, um, I sometimes consider that there is a lot of like lost or uncaptured trade, largely because people are trying to avoid paying customs duties, right? Because sometimes it's excessive. And I think it's very common, particularly around the continent, as someone who, who's got family members in another country who often um, are participate in a similar custom as Kolo does. I think so there's a lot of that trade that's really not captured. Perhaps that's what we should consider as informal trade. But thank you so much, um, members of our panel. Thank you so much to the questions. We really appreciate people who attended this webinar with us. Please join us for our last webinar next week. Um, it's around the same time. I think it's, it is at the same time, right? It is at 2.30. It's Tuesday at the same time. Yes. So please join us at the same time. Um, really appreciate the questions. We appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Kolo. Thank you so much, Prof. Claren. Um, thank you so much to Fran and also in his absence to Prof. Uh, Akinikugu. We really appreciate his work, especially at Afroeconomics Afro blog. Um, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And disclaimer, I'm not like a fool.